Hello, everybody, and welcome to this LSE Ideas discussion in partnership with the Polish Cultural Institute. Um, our topic is Seeing Central Europe 30 Years On, Film and Arts in the Visegrad Countries. My name is Dr. Mary Martin. I'm a Senior Policy Fellow at LSE Ideas. Um, I'm also the Director of Intent New Theatre, which creates opportunities for theatre artists in Eastern Europe to work with UK theatres. So the topic of our discussion today is very close to my heart. It is 30 years since Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic and Slovakia established the Visegrad Group in the aftermath of 1989 and the post-Cold War era. And to mark that, we're going to talk about how the performing arts, film and theatre particularly, have been part of the history of those three decades in the region and what the cultural scene in the countries is today, what it looks like in a period when uh, politics and economics are once again in a certain state of flux and perhaps turmoil. To help us navigate um, some of the interesting uh, threads of this topic, uh, we have five very distinguished speakers who can help us uh, with, with the discussion and questions afterwards. We're going to hear from them one by one in turn, and then we will have plenty of time for questions. If you want to put a question to any of the panelists, please put it in the chat box and we will um, pick them afterwards um, and so we can, we can have a, a good discussion. Um, as ever with these things, we have one uh, panelist who has some technical difficulties and hasn't uh, been able to join, but um, hopefully will do so soon. But let me begin by introducing them all. Um, firstly, Karel Och has worked for the Carla Vivari International Film Festival as a member of the selection committee. In 2010, he was appointed the festival's artistic director. He's also a member of the European Film Academy and the Lux Prize Selection Panel. Our second speaker is Shaba Kyle. He is the uh, prize-winning Hungarian film director, the government commissioner for the development of the Hungarian film industry, the chairman of the National Film Institute and CEO of Mupa Budapest, Hungary's acclaimed cultural institution. Christoph, who I can now see, I'm pleased to report, who was having some difficulties, but uh, really glad to see you, Christoph. Uh, Christoph Sanusi <laughs> is a film and theatre director, Ooh. producer and uh, scriptwriter. electricity <laughs> He has directed many celebrated feature films, including Camouflage, The Year of Quiet Sun, Foreign Body. He's the author of several books and a member of the European Film Academy Board. And until September 2019 was president of Tor Film Productions. Susanna Ulichanska is based in Bratislava. She's a theater critic, publicist and manager. She chairs the Slovak section of the International Association of theatre critics and um, has been a member of its executive committee since 2018. She's covered the arts for Slovak Daily SME. Um, she's been the head of PR at the Theatre Institute Bratislava and was co-founder of the Bordoski Theatre Award. She's also uh, the author of several radio and theatre plays. And Irena Taskovsky is CEO and founder of Taskovsky Films, a London-based global sales and production company with offices across Europe. She's a film consultant, an expert on marketing, sales, financing and fest festivals for many film institutions, including HBO Europe and the Asian Cinema Fund, among others. I think you'll agree that it's an incredible lineup and we're very grateful to you all for joining today. So in that order, I'm going to start by asking Carol to um, begin and tell us a little bit about um, the topics of, your, of today's discussion from your perspective, Carol. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm really delighted uh, to gather here with everyone uh, on such a special occasion for our... See about... Until about a year ago, uh, like many others, I would be 
spending many days traveling, almost 100 days a year I would spend outside of Czech Republic uh, because of the circumstances that everyone knows and is part of uh, during the last year. Uh, I'm confined and, and staying home and, and have time, I've had time to realize what it feels like to take care of more of your own space, uh, space around you. Your and obviously the space around you is defined not only by you, but mainly by your neighbors and your relationships with them, which is something uh, what makes uh, our anniversary and uh, the collective of our four countries very special. Uh, Central Europe, center itself, of course, it's uh, not a word which exists by itself, but it's always defined what's around it. Uh, left, right from the center, east, west from the center. Uh, the Karlovary International Film Festival, which is uh, considered um, by the most important uh, and the oldest film event in Central Eastern Europe, uh, have always thought about its own position. Um, the festival itself was uh, placed in uh, the western part of Czech Republic near the German border in the Sudetenland, which is a very, very um, important uh, part of the middle of Europa, central Europe, and of course of the history of Karlovy Film Festival. And uh, mainly after its rebirth in the early 90s, uh, the focus uh, on the former, uh, let's say, Soviet bloc and the countries which uh, belong to the uh, used to belong to the let's say Soviet satellite was uh, stronger and uh, we are very, we've been very proud of of mainly of the program called East of the West which is uh, a section called uh, like that because of uh, young filmmakers from Central Eastern Europe that we've been trying to support throughout uh, almost thirty years and uh, we've had a chance to basically create uh, a certain bridge between East and West which we think center should do, uh, to facilitate the conversations, to try uh, filmmakers and artists from Central Europe to uh, engage in conversations and maybe also in collaborations with uh, colleagues from uh, all around the world. And uh, uh, we will definitely continue doing so. Uh, throughout our work, uh, we've been obviously addressing very important issue of the last 30 years uh, of our territory and that's transformation. Uh, I look forward to discussing today uh, both the transformation institutional, which is of course very important in the world of cinema uh, as an art which is not cheap to make, let's say it's very expensive, but also and mainly the transformation uh, of the soul, uh, the mentality of people for coming from Central Europe and especially the artists that we've been trying to support. And if I may uh, end uh, this opening words on a personal note, uh, I started to work for Kalaiwai 20 years ago in 2001 uh, as a jury secretary and the very first uh, of the amazing filmmakers I met in Kalaiwai was Mr. Christoph Zanussi, vice part of the panel. He was the head of the jury and I was hum his humble servant, the jury secretary. So it's especially uh, symbolic of this reunion after 20 years and I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karel. I think when we were discussing the other day this this panel, um, I think that the mix of the personal and the institutional is is something that's always so rich when one's talking about the arts. So thank you for um, telling us a bit about that. Um, it is uh, inevitable that geography plays as well as the regionalism plays um, a part in this conversation, and we're lucky to have everybody uh, representatives from across. The region. So I'm going to turn, as it were, to Hungary now, if I may. And Shaba, um, can you tell us how how history and maybe a bit about the future looks from from your point of view? Good afternoon for everybody. I'm happy to be with you. It's a very special occasion, and uh, if I may, I start with a small historical review because the first conference of this region was 30 and 35 in Visegrad. It's, uh, Visegrad was the uh, royal palace of the Hungarian uh, king, uh, Charles uh, I, and uh, he invited uh, 
Casimir uh, III, uh, King of Poland, and, uh, and uh, John of I uh, of Bohemia, the, the uh, Bohemian Czech uh, 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 king, uh, to a meeting. And uh, maybe it was the first uh, experience about how can we create a small European Union. <laughs> but uh, it, it was uh, quite a successful uh, meeting uh, because uh, after uh, several uh, uh, century in, in uh, 1992 uh, uh, founded the, the Visegrad groups, uh, the Central European uh, 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 collaboration uh, uh, between uh, uh, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, uh, uh, Poland, and, and Hungary. So this is all uh, historical roots uh, from the past. And what about us now? Uh, it's also the history because uh, 30 years ago, uh, I was a special guest in London as a student. Uh, it was a East West Producer Seminar. Uh, it was organized by the British Council uh, and uh, David Putnam, the famous producer, Linda Mize, uh, also a famous producer, and Katya Krausova, maybe do you know Katya? Uh, uh, she, she was a very good friend of mine uh, because she is a, a Bratislava, uh, uh, was the original home, but uh, Hungarian relatives and uh, li lived in London. So it was a totally mixed. And it was a very, very big adventure for us because uh, uh, the British Council invited uh, from the four countries, uh, directors, producers, uh, filmmakers, and they uh, tried to uh, give a special knowledge for us uh, how can we make uh, in a new uh, capitalist system movies? Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very interesting meeting uh, because until that moment, uh, I, I was grew up uh, by a socialist uh, filmmaking system. I finished my uh, uh, film school in uh, uh, 89. My teacher was uh, Istvan Sabo and Karol Mark, uh, good friends of uh, Christoph Sanusi. <laughs> and uh, we were the first unemployed uh, class in the school because earlier, uh, everybody who finished the, the Hungarian Theater and, and Film Academy had a job in a, a social film studio. But after that, it finished and uh, we had to go to the advertising business and we started to produce and, and direct and make uh, commercial films. But it was a very good school among us uh, because we learned a lot uh, about the filmmaking, about the new kind of uh, uh, filmmaking. And uh, all days uh, I have a chance to make a, a new kind of uh, Hungarian uh, film industry after Andy Voina. Andy Voina was a world famous uh, Hungarian origin American producer. And um, 10 years ago, he started a, a new movement uh, to recreate the Hungarian film industry. Uh, unfortunately, two years ago, uh, he passed away and uh, I became uh, after him the, the uh, new uh, leader of, of the Hungarian uh, film industry. And uh, we founded a, a new Hungarian film institute uh, with a lot of ideas and, and uh, we started to build up uh, a, a new system. Maybe later I, I will uh, tell uh, about the, the future Hungarian uh, films. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, the leader of, of uh, the MUPA. MUPA is the Palace of Arts of Hungary. We are the Budapest South Bank Center because uh, uh, our, our uh, sister institute, uh, the South Bank Center, for example. 
and uh, I'm in the cultural life of this region of Central Europe, and I'm uh, very happy to share my knowledge with you about the, the cultural thing. Thank you very much. Shama, thank you. Um, thank you for reminding us also, I think, how moments of what seems certainly like uncertainty or, or crisis and change can produce some uh, good new opportunities. Maybe that's something we need to bear in mind at, at the moment as well. Um, as Carol said, we're, we're facing very different conditions um, across the board in, in making art and so on. But um, perhaps uh, we can learn from what happened to you uh, at that moment, you know, 30 years ago. Um, thank you. So moving on, uh, Christoph has been mentioned already by um, two of our panelists. Christoph, uh, welcome to you. I say I think you had some some difficulties, but we're really pleased to see you here. Um, tell us how it's looked the last uh, the last decade or so for you, and what how do you see today in terms of your country, your work, and the region? Well, that's a question. When when to start? <laughs> I'm eighty, so I have long memory, and I am naturally inclined to start with World War II or maybe even earlier, because Poland did not exist through the whole 19th century. We were under partitions, so unlike our neighbors, who had only one occupant, we had three. And there are three different traditions in Poland. One heredity, is a heredity of Prussia, the other is heredity of Austria or Austro-Hungary, and the third is Russia, very different. So we have very different distinguished mentalities that now merge, but the tendencies are still different and you can often feel it. Now, after 56, when uh, Khrushchev came to power and proclaimed the foe, we were like Hungary, almost on the, on the edge of rebellion and of uprising. It didn't occur. I think that was uh, great luck that we didn't have a bloodshed. But communists, authorized by Moscow, left far more freedom to Poland than to other satellite countries. So we had private industry, we had private uh, agriculture, and there was more space for freedom in culture. And one basic difference when I compare my experience from the communist time with the experience of my colleagues in DDR or in the Soviet Union was that we obtained, we filmmakers, had the right of initiative. We could initiate the project and the authorities were censoring the project. But in other countries, it was authorities who were proposing projects of subject matters and trying to stimulate artists to follow their, their basic uh, suggestions. So this was rather fortunate. There's also something remarkable when I, when I notice it now, that among our artists, only two were party members. All others, leading the, the directors, leading people of theater in Poland, were not members of the, of, the, of the Communist Party. And it was a privilege that we could avoid this, uh, this uh, affiliation. So neither Vaida nor Kutz nor Haas were part of not, not myself. None of us was member of the Communist Party. And we, that was tolerated. That was something that authorities tolerated. Also, most writers and distinguished artists were not openly linked to the system. Some of us were open dissidents, some were half dissidents, but none of us was identified with the ruling regime. So at the moment of change, it was natural that artists were on the side of the new movement. Andrzej Wajda became a senator 
like some other distinguished actors, all always very respected. And that gave us more influence over new democratic government. And we achieved relatively a good law about film. It took us a long time because the existing law, which we inherited from Soviet, Soviet domination time, was quite, was already quite liberal and quite good. But now we have a system with certain rotation of the, uh, let us say, panelists who decide which project will be supported. And we have national fund, which is constructed like in France with, I think, one and a half percent of all income from advertisement uh, on television, on uh, television, radio, and of course, cinema goes for the national fund for cinema. So from this point of view, I think we have no reason to complain. However, system is not perfect. No system is ever perfect. What happened, what I'm rather proud of, that we had after 89, there was no particular crisis. Filmmaking continued. And we had very soon some quite remarkable and quite meaningful films to appear. And some films very critical of us, very critical of liberal and democratic new reality. We were critical from the very beginning. Some of our colleagues were creating films very, very, showing a very negative image of the transition. Uh, one of our veterans, Jerzy Hoffman, created a very important and meaningful film, historical film based on the no a novel by uh, Nobel Prize, Prize winner Sienkiewicz. And the novel, original novel, with sword and fire, was absolutely nationalistic. And the film made in the Free Poland was a revision of this original vision, which was unfair to our neighbors in Ukraine, and was showing the same historical reality in different perspective. I think it was a good sign. And there were more such films. Still, I see that there is quite a remarkable number of films that are very critical of ourselves. So, we have in Poland bad tradition of national arrogance and aloofness and what other adjective I should choose. But on the other side, we, sorry, uh, on the other side, yes, I, I know I got the message that I'm too long. So the fact that this autocritical view is present in cinema is very important. But on the other hand, aside, we have commercial cinema and populism, which is growing and which is unfortunately very much uh, promoted by current government. Christoph, thank you. Thank you for those initial thoughts. We will come back, but I think um, uh, the idea of, of, of the critical view artistically is something, you know, to be further explored. I know, I think you're also involved in theatre and perhaps wondering if, if that presents different kinds of dynamics. But maybe first we'll turn to Susanna, who is also in the theatre from Slo Slovak Republic, um, Slovakia. Um, just to get a, a slightly different view from her. Christoph, for the moment, thank you. Um, Susanna, um, tell us what it looks like from where you sit in the stalls, as it were, in the, in the theatre. Do you recognise some of the same dynamics that have gone on historically and, and are there today, or is it different? Um, very much uh, the same. I would say that uh, uh, Visegrad Cooperation has been with us not for 30 years, but m much longer time in our history. Uh, 
Uh, I would say that uh, the, without the help of uh, countries that are around us, um, we would not have uh, the, uh, the independent Slovak theatre. Um, I'm. I would like to go a little bit further to the uh, to the the history, to the beginning and the founding of Czechoslovak Republic in uh, uh, 1918, and subsequently uh, um, the. Uh, I, I would like to talk about the uh, rise of national institutions in Slovakia. Um, uh, for instance, the case for National Theatre is famous for uh, great cooperation between the Czech uh, and at that time not existent Slovak uh, theatre people. Uh, as the uh, Czech, Slovak National Theatre uh, was built in 1920 in a city where majority of uh, uh, inhabitants at the time was uh, uh, Hungarians and mostly Germans. Uh, there were only 10% of Slavic speaking uh, inhabitants of Bratislava at that time. It was uh, one of the uh, best examples of multicultural city that was truly uh, Central European with, with a lot of different minorities living uh, more or less peacefully <laughs> all together. Uh, but in this uh, uh, situation to, to build a Slovak speaking theater had no commercial sense. And so it was really just a political decision uh, to improve and to support uh, then Czechoslovak identity. And in a way, uh, the theater uh, in Slovakia still does not make uh, a big commercial sense. So it has to be still funded and supported by, by po various political uh, um, institutions. Uh, even today, 40% of our um, finances for theatres uh, is uh, going from the state directly, another um, great portion through the self-government bodies, and uh, only very few uh, money is really raised by uh, box office uh, and uh, by some independent sponsors. So this is also one of the reasons why it's very difficult to talk about total independence of the Slovak um, theatre in political terms. We do have a very good uh, Slovak uh, Arts Council. Uh, quite recently, um, it was uh, it started in two, uh, 2016, but it's functioning and it's helping a lot. Uh, thanks to this uh, Slovak Arts Council, uh, we can now have almost 90 uh, independent theatre companies, but it's more or less uh, uh, everything is based on a, on a very small scale. Almost none of these uh, companies have uh, uh, their own venue and their own um, like stability, which, which was uh, very tragically tragically shown during the pandemic. That is structure based on one of grants, individual support uh, was just. Hit so easily hit that uh, at the moment the the, uh, the state of arts in Slovakia is is uh, very very uh, very poor. So uh, in in terms of uh, theatre life, we share very much the just going back to history. We share very much the same uh, tradition, same. A system of national theatres. We we share very much the same authors, and uh, uh, many of our founding fathers came from uh, from Czech Republic or from other um, 
uh, other countries and obviously cooperation is very vivid uh, between Hungary and Slovakia thanks to our quite uh, important uh, Hungarian minority living in, in Slovakia. So back uh, to to the uh, to, uh, to you, Mary. Uh, I, I don't think we are we are really celebrating 30 years of uh, our cooperation, but much uh, uh, higher and longer uh, history. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you for, um, for, for touching on some important um, threads in that history too. I think one of them that you, you mentioned obviously was the kind of the economic aspect. We can talk about, you know, the, um, the artistic um, record, which has certainly been very strong across all countries in the region. But um, I think the kind of political institutions and the economics of the industry are also part of this picture. And perhaps Irena, you might be able to tell us a little bit about that. Um, the floor is yours. Now, I, I guess everyone can hear me. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's lovely to be part of this panel and uh, it's always special especially this year when we can't see each other in the real life and many, many of meetings and events were happening on Zoom. And uh, as always in life, anything that happens, I try to look in the positive side of it. So the same like this, I guess now that we, we're not able to travel and see each other in film festivals or other cultural events, I, I guess we even more appreciate each other and uh, appreciate these kind of meetings and events and sharings more than ever before. So thank you for organizing this and thank you for being all together here tonight. So my name is Irena Taskowski and I originally come from Bosnia. And you may wonder how come I ended up in Visegrad uh, uh, panel tonight. So uh, I would see my role um, because in age of 17, and because we had a war in Yugoslavia, I left Yugoslavia at that time and came to Prague where I finished my film studies at FAMU. And after I moved to London when I did a national film and television school, also studied a uh, producing course in, uh, in, in London. And since the beginning of my career, which is now 20 years, um, I run a company based in London called Toskowski Films, which is one of the leading production and uh, international distribution companies. And the fact that um, I had that bad luck or good luck, we can see it both ways, that I experienced war, uh, and had to move from one day to another to another country, uh, I realized even at that early age that actually my mission in life should be about connecting cultures and uh, using art uh, to actually connect people, to, to, to show what is beautiful about each of our cultures, but in the same time, what is that we have in common. And that's what I dedicated last 20 years of my work uh, to. And the fact that I studied and came to Prague um, so early, there was immediate uh, kind of uh, love uh, towards the not only Czech cinema and theater, but also Slovak and all the other countries from Visegrad countries. And since starting my company, I was, uh, especially in the beginning, mostly working with some of the biggest uh, names of uh, filmmakers, especially from documentary scene uh, from those countries. Uh, at that time, 20 years ago, when I started um, in Visegrad countries, but overall in Eastern European countries, that there was not really culture of international distribution, um, which means that mostly when films were made, they were shown in the country that they are made, and there were some collaboration done maybe in the neighborhood countries, but uh, it was only a little amount of films that actually were present in other parts of the world. Uh, so I was very happy to uh, take role in that um, and bring some of the most important filmmakers be seen outside of their countries. So people that I work with, it's uh, Philip Remunda and Vit Klusak, who I produced their first film called Czech Dream uh, and many others after, or Helena Treshtikova from Czech Republic. And uh, even though she was very established in her own country, she wasn't really known yet uh, outside of the country. So we represented her film Rene, Katka and Marcella. And we worked with also people from uh, uh, Hungary, with Agnes Sos, with Stream of Love, uh, with uh, Slovak directors like Petr Kerekes, Markos Kop. So basically in all the Michigan countries, we discovered uh, talented people the last 20 years and made sure that their films will be seen outside. 
Um, so that's basically just shortly what uh, I have been doing in the last 20 years. And I really think that um, the beauty of art uh, of any form, it's in, as I said, like uh, showing us about ourselves, but also opening up to others and uh, enjoying uh, our dif differences um, and not being afraid of each other and just finding the way how to live in harmony uh, in, and make better humanity together. Thank you, Irina. That's a great note to 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 finish the um, our initial conversations on. Um, and I'd like to perhaps take that forward and and kind of probe it a bit, though. Um, perhaps I could ask Karel. I mean, this idea of identity. Irina said it's about the art is about who we are. Um, how has that sense of identity through the arts? Um, is there still a Visegrad identity? Um, has it grown stronger or perhaps the reverse? Has it weakened under the influence of being in the EU and perhaps more recently the kind of waves of, of nationalism? Uh, for example, is, is the Kalavi Vari Film Festival, do you see it as, as a, a, re, a showcase for regional work or is it more an international event that happens to be in the Czech Republic in this region. How do you see kind of the, the issue of identity or maybe it doesn't, doesn't feature as strongly anymore? Karel. Uh, the identity is, is a, a very tricky element because Visegrad started as, a, as a, a collective of three countries, right? Because back then Czechoslovakia was still one country. And then two years later, it had become Visegrad 4. And uh, there was a lot of fear when Czech Republic and Slovakia was being parted or parting. And what I feel now is that we feel with our Slovak friends and neighbors much closer than we used to feel. So it was a political decision. And that identity of Czechoslovakia before and Czech Republic and Slovakia now, it's not too different, but there's a difference. And there's a lot of support from within the people. And what we try to do in Karlovy Vary is uh, really to uh, gather the artists, obviously from around the world, but uh, mainly from, from our region, of which Visegrad is a key part, component, and to uh, kind of uh, guide them through the jungle of, of the film uh, world and film industry. Uh, Irena knows very well what I'm talking about because that's been her job for many years. Uh, once you make the film, it is just half of your work done because then the other half starts and it's to how you bring the film to the people. And basically, festivals are the best platforms because the, the con uh, concentration of, of energy, uh, the creative energy is so great that it really can show some uh, results on the spot. So imagine bringing uh, tens of filmmakers from Poland, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Hungary, and other countries. Uh, we uh, basically show their films, not only to the audience, but also the professionals, maybe uh, future co-producers of their films. And during all those meetings, uh, the filmmakers, uh, the young artists are kind of forced to define their identity, right? Uh, how they feel as citizens of, respective countries, of a region, of the world. Uh, I've always enjoyed the fact that uh, Visegrad uh, was a group in, in which I felt we have, we're sharing something, maybe artificially because it's a, it's a kind of a contract, but uh, it's with the neighbors that we've always loved. But at the same time, we have such, so much differences with uh, our friends from Poland and uh, Hungarians. So we enjoy the differences and we kind of, uh, and it's not only uh, artistically, but also humanly uh, feel enriched by the identity of our friends from Hungary, Slovakia and Poland. So all this is happening on an uh, artistic and human level during any festival anywhere in the world. And uh, yes, it's, it's really exciting. Thank you. Um, Shaba, I wondered from your point of view, this idea is you obviously talked about almost having to change your identity at the moment when you had to remake the Hungarian film industry but has was solidarity also important across with your with your neighbors and does that continue to 
play a role in, in your work, the fact that you are part of a kind of a regional identity? Yeah, so uh, first of all, I'm a Central Europe lover, absolutely. <laughs> and I uh, offer and suggest for everybody this wonderful region because uh, we have here everything. We have uh, the, uh, in uh, Northern Poland, a uh, wonderful sea, in, uh, in Croatia, a uh, wonderful uh, South Sea, we have wonderful hills in Slovakia, uh, uh, we have uh, also in, uh, in Romania uh, uh, very exciting foods everywhere uh, and our, our common history. And, and this uh, common history and common roots, uh, this is our identity. And uh, it was a very interesting experience by the Soviet Union because they try, uh, uh, try to keep out uh, from our identity and they wanted uh, to make us as a ho homo sovieticus. Yeah, a homo sovieticus has no past, no roots, no nothing. But uh, here in Central Europe, we have stronger roots and uh, we, we, we living together since, uh, since a thousand years. We have very special uh, identity on the field of sense of humor, for example. For, for mm -hmm. you, uh, English people, uh, we, we can say uh, you have a very special sense of humor, the English one, but we have a very special here in Central Europe and then we, we can understand each other. In the Villa of Hrabal, uh, uh, the, the Czechs, uh, Slovaks uh, love Karinti. Uh, maybe you don't know who was Fra Ferenc Karinti. He was a fantastic uh, writer in, 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 in Hungary. And uh, for me, this is a wonderful occasion, uh, all days, to discover again how strong is this region. Uh, we have no here uh, oil, uh, but we have a very special energy. The special energy is our culture, our common culture. This is wonderful and everywhere, uh, I, I love to travel in Poland, for example, to, to go to Krakow and, and to, to meet uh, these, these uh, values uh, which are coming from the past, but uh, these are on the street or days too. It's, it's not, uh, uh, not a, a route uh, only to the past, but uh, bring these this values to our, our, our life. And it came, uh, you know, in, we leave the, this side of the Iron Curtain. And we had no opportunity to go to West, for example, but we traveled a lot to Prague, to Warsaw Jazz Festival, uh, to ski uh, Rusion Baroque. Uh, so th th this is my identity. And uh, at that time I was very sad because of course uh, I wanted to go to Paris and New York and so on. But it's, it's very interesting because all days I'm very happy because I I know quite well uh, this region uh, by town by town, uh, by food by food. So, so uh, this is very important. And I think so our task or days somehow to tell our stories, mm -hmm. to st tell our stories from the past and uh, from the present. Uh, because uh, here is a very strange situation. We are living together in the European Union but we don't know enough from each other, from, from our everyday life. What is happening with you, uh, Christoph, with you, Susanna, Karel? What, what is your everyday life? How, and and uh, while uh, we lived in this side, the Iron Curtain, for example, we couldn't watch American movies. But that was a very happy time because we could mm -hmm. watch Italian movies, French movies, Polish, Czech, English, Russian. And we know better in the 70s what's happening with the poor uh, Italian family, because uh, we could see. Now in Budapest, we have several movie theaters, but it's very, very different to watch not American movies, but, but European movies. And we have to make uh, a campaign about our European life because I would like to know what's happening 
with you, uh, Mary, by the Brexit. And I, I, I would like to know more about that because we are building our new future. But if we, we don't know each other uh, good enough, it's, there is no chance to be alive. Yeah, sorry, I was maybe... No, no, no. <laughs> Thank you, Shabba. I think it, um, yes, it's a, it's a constant refrain. We don't know enough about neighbors sometimes, do we? We, we live beside them. Um, but I want also to talk about politics. We can never leave politics out of things. And uh, Christoph, you, you mentioned um, that there were obviously, um, there's political influence. I suppose political influence there was um, at the time of, of when Visegrad was set up or before that in terms of pressure and perhaps censorship. Um, what does what are the relations today between politics and the arts in in your country and the region? Is is it a positive one? Is it a neutral one? How do you how do you find working with the politics? Oh my God, I spent all my career <laughs> confronted by politics. Definitely, politics is not my cup of tea. I, I think there are more important things than politics. But in the current situation, I think what we are really missing is a dream, is a common dream. There was once for us quite clearly definite uh, European dream, something what was, can, could be considered as a counterposition to the American dream. American dream attracted millions all over the world all over the planet, people who wanted to join the United States as the best possible reality. In fact, it was not always best possible. And I think in Europe, we felt that Europe has maybe better dream than America. But this dream in Western Europe seems to be falling apart recently. There is no self-confidence. There is not much hope. There is self-criticism going beyond the limit of common sense and very, very vague perspective. What kind of society we dream about? Society of consumption? That's, is it enough? Could we develop without ideals, without great perspectives, without metaphysics? that led Europe through centuries. I think we, in our part of the world, we were so enthusiastic <clears throat> about Europe 30 years ago, believing that Europe is a better way of life. And obviously it is a better way, but it is not as promising as many of us expected. And there is enough bitterness and self-criticism in our own cinema there is endless self-criticism in European cinema. But where is enthusiasm? Where is hope? Where is energy? Where is desire to make this world better and change things which are not good and which are deeply wrong? I think liberal consumerism brought us to a deep crisis. And maybe being a peripheral countries, we see it more clearly because our disappointment is more obvious. And I think that's what unites us, why I find so much in common with my Hungarian, Czech or Slovak friends. It is because we are all, I think, to a big extent disappointed because our European dream seems to be, well, it does exist, I don't want to deny, it does exist, but it is quite ephemeral, quite weak at the moment. And I think we have to to contribute, to recreate it, however ambitious it sounds, but sometimes peripheral views are more valid than metropolitan views. Mm -hmm. So I'm full of confidence that good ideas will come from the distant countries, maybe not from the heart of Europe, because heart of Europe seems to be rather, rather cold our days. Mm -hmm. But that's sorry for that. So generalization, I'm not authorized to generalize so much, but that's my disappointment. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
certainly um, it seems that um, when one looks across Europe, the kind of the chances for a, a Europe, a West East Europe um, uh, cultural industry, which should have come about with the European Union, hasn't really happened, does it? We still um, we still have a lot of fragmentation. Susanna, you had mentioned, I was quite impressed, I think you said there are 90 independent theatre companies in, um, in, in Slovakia. Um, does that translate into, you said also there was no real independence, does that translate into um, a vibrant movement of criticism, constructive criticism? Christoph is saying there's too much self-criticism. What, what is theatre and independent theatre contributing to the political scene and the, and the vibrancy of public discourse, do you think? Um, thank you very much for this absolutely relevant question. This is basically what we are uh, trying to solve and trying to answer. This is really the question for for present uh, uh, theatre life in in Slovakia. Uh, we um, I um, I started with the uh, with one theatre uh, historically in 1920, and now there is a lot of different uh, um, a lot of different initiatives, but. Uh, we have to say that during the communism, be, be obviously because of political and ideological reasons, uh, the state was much more willing to finance and sub, uh, finance the building of new theater venues, new uh, cultural centers, etc. Since just just for you to understand the scope of this negligence uh, to the arts in in our country, that since the uh, fall of communism, there we only just finished uh, national new national theatre uh, that was originally started by communists back in 80s. Um, it's sort of Slovak South Bank really done in, in, in the, the, the form and in uh, uh, being architecturally um, inspired by South Bank in London. But this was basically a project that started back in communism. And since that time, we only had a couple of few, few uh, smaller projects. Um, I do not want to just talk about uh, buildings. Obviously, it's not uh, what the heart of, um, of, of uh, theater is, but, but theater is a, um, a very... Um, sensitive uh, structure and basically it needs some some venue to be showed so uh, uh the, the these 90 uh, independent companies are uh, more or less uh, one of uh, associations that are sh joining together for one or two performances. Only very few of, of them uh, have been able to sustain for, let's say, a decade. The, uh, we are just celebrating the uh, anniversary or 30 anniversary, exactly like Visegrad, of independent company Stoka that was one of the very first independent companies that really at the time opened uh, the minds of uh, ours towards the new base of expression, theatrical expression, the, the authenticity of their actors or rather non-actors no act, non uh, was to us at the time just appalling and, and uh, just, just uh, something that we haven't experienced before. But still, after 30 years, this company led by Blaho Uhlar has no space to show their productions. And if you click on their website, they, it says next performances, question mark, question mark, question mark. And it says also, we are not showing our performances, not just because of pandemic, but because we do not have a place to, 
to 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 show our performances. So this is a just very sad example of uh, one a company that re of course it has not remained the same. A lot of uh, uh, splits occur during the history, but uh, Blaura is still working with new new company and new stu students and uh, young actors. So it's still alive, but with really appalling financial support. So uh, uh, the independence is costly and sometimes uh, you have to pay the, the, even the highest price for, for the independence. And once you are in a, some sort of structure that enables you to survive, uh, yes, you, you can criticize a lot of things and uh, people, uh, theatre people are criticizing a lot of things. They are very critical to to let's say communist regime or to to uh, Nazism, but obviously they are not very free to to be critical to the present government. Mm -hmm. So um, because no one knows whether uh, this criticism will not lead to cutting of some some some. Uh, some grants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Obviously, we, there is this um, arms lens principle in the Slovak Arts Council. So, I I'm not talking about direct censorship, but definitely there is a lot of uh, self -sense censoring. For instance, at the moment, the political is at the stage of revolving stages, really. It's very dramatic. We, we are seeing a lot of uh, politicians being put to jail, those who were um, in power for last decade. And But the um, apart from few films recently uh, released, very popular, uh, there was not a big criticism to, to the, the government uh, that um, uh, that just stopped. Uh, uh, so I, I would say it's a very in a sort uh, is a comfortable to be critical to to the um, slow state uh, secret police during the communism because no one really is so sensitive to this issue anymore. But the present corruption and links to mafia are very, very sensitive. I'm, I'm critical, but it doesn't mean that they were not very uh, important, very important um, shows that were even on the stage, big stage of uh, national theatres such as Elites uh, or No Show Today uh, uh, by Jirka Havelka, the Czech uh, director, that were really uh, able to attract a lot of audience and raised very important questions. But in a general, uh, artists somehow a little bit uh, escaping to the arts for the art's sake, a little bit escaping to abstract uh, uh, presentation rather than being very topical. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you for that, that view. Um, it is obviously a, a time when arts everywhere, not just in, in Central Europe, are facing extraordinary challenges. And as you said, Suzanne, you know, it's about structures, it's about physical structures as well as kind of um, how people organize their work and, and, and organize their creativity. Irena, do you think um, when you look at the kind of future now over the next few years, um, a lot of, well, my own country certainly has had to have a huge bailout of, of theaters and the culture industry. Is there anything similar in the region? How do you see the robustness, the resilience or not of, of the structures for making films and producing films? How do you see that facing the current crisis? Uh, well, I have to say, uh, like always again, I'm always trying to look what is positive in all of this. And even though, of course, this year was a very special year, but I could, and of course, affected many, many filmmakers all around the globe uh, both in making films, but also distributing films. But still, 
uh, I see things moving forward. Uh, it's not that it's all stopped. Um, going from country to country, I guess um, there are still films being made, there are still films being financed. And from distribution point of view, even though festivals cannot be happening in the physical form, but they're all going, most of them, they're going online. And as uh, Carol said, festivals have really important role for many film, films that are being made in all these countries, especially when we are talking about art house cinema. Uh, so this is uh, happening. And at the same time, uh, I, I, I noticed that lots of new collaborations were, were established. For example, even our own company, we started our own little VOD platform where people can just go online and watch films. And then what we did also, we started lots of new collaborations with cinemas because cinemas couldn't start couldn't show films anymore in physical theaters. So we started doing online screenings, like organized online screenings and inviting people to watch film together, even though from your own home, but still having this collective um, feeling of being together and then discussing the film online. So there are small steps happening and uh, we are all hoping that this will be over soon and that we will just continue like before. But, um, you know, like every crisis, there is something to learn from and get to see what, how, just to kind of adjust and see that even until it was never easy, but when something like this happens, you start just being somehow even more creative and even more kind of inventive, not only in terms of like, what kind of ideas we want to talk about in films, but also how do we produce them? How do we distribute them? So yeah, I think it's, it was never easy, especially as I said in art house, but uh, it's always something new to come. And it's not all stopped. Yes. Yeah. Um, great. Thank you. Well, we've got some uh, interesting questions that touch on some of those and other points from from our audience. Um, I'm going to uh, begin with, uh, sorry, not in the order that you necessarily came in and asked them, but um, uh, it just seemed to me that um, Derek Woodgate's question, Professor Derek Re uh, Woodgate uh, from Rijeka, Croatia, beyond traditional art forms, to what degree are the digital interactive arts successfully empowering, um, sorry, I've lost it, um, successfully empowering political discussion in the region through paradigm shifting format? So that's a bit about what you were mentioning with new formats, Irena, but perhaps uh, any of the other panelists like to pick up on that. What new, what, what's the relationship between new forms and, um, and, and political discussion? Irena, do you want to have a go at that first? Let me see. So uh, just to, to kind of, so you are asking this new formats that are kind of started now because of the Corona times, how that affecting political situation. Is that what you are saying? Are they, are they empowering political discussion? Yeah. A digital interactive art successfully empowering political discussion in the region through paradigm shifting formats. That's Derek would get good, good question. Well, I, I can't say anything like for as a fact for the political and how but what I can see just like for always from the people point of view the fact that we are all collectively put for the first time ever in humanity in the same situation I don't think there was any other event ever happening that everyone doesn't matter which part of the world or planet we came from has experienced the same thing at the same time and just this awareness of the fact that doesn't matter are we from Central Europe, from UK or US or, or uh, Latin America, we have experienced one thing at the same time, which kind of brings to human consciousness something that is this togetherness and uh, that we all in different parts of the world start realizing certain things. And the fact that uh, before we had to travel and be physically connected and planning and working together, suddenly we also realized we can connect and there is something that we have in common. So I, I feel Again, even though this was not so good for all of us, but on the other side, it, 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 it kind of empowered us. No, it's, it's suddenly lots of people who are thinking the same, living for the same thing are now connected. And uh, if there are not immediate changes happening, I think there are many changes to come in the future months and years, thanks to what just happened. So I don't know if I fully answered your question, but I think at least it gave some base to it. 
Thank you. Yes. I add something uh, maybe specific concerning last year. Uh, we had to cancel, obviously, the physical version of the festival, but at some point of late spring, the cinemas were reopened, so we kind of uh, gathered together a bunch of films and we started to tour Czech Republic. Obviously, we could not gather people in the, in the town of the festival, Karlovy, but we decided to support local cinemas by going around and we did a few, let's say, new formats, uh, which uh, allowed us to maybe do something that we could not do during a physical festival, meaning to connect with the filmmakers and to connect with all the cinemas at the same time, which was about 85 cinemas. And we did a Q&A with, let's say, Italian filmmakers concerning their films and uh, direct questions uh, being asked from all, kind, all sorts of uh, corners of the Czech Republic allowed them to start talking quite openly about the political situation in Italy and how their film uh, in specific from Bad Tales, which was presented last year at the Berlinale, uh, reflected the political re situation. So uh, there was a direct uh, conversation with uh, hundreds of people through Rome, I mean, from Rome, through digital media or through digital means, maybe it would have been less impactful because the movie would have been screened in a cinema for 500 people, 1,000 people, maybe with who knows how many people in the hall. So. Uh, when there is uh, will and creativity, uh, and I'm not talking about Carlo I've seen many online festivals uh, creating all kinds of discussion platforms, which really allowed discussion. Maybe, you know, people who are coming from the countries originally of the Visegrad, but they live in you know, the United States, etc. So if we can use the means, well, we can be even more connected and uh, the political discussion can be stronger. Thank you. I've got a question from Attila Kirali, who's a film TV lecturer at Buckinghamshire College in the UK. He's teaching the um, 16 to 21 age group, the youngest in the UK, entering the world of media. He says, as a result of the endless tsunami of high budget Hollywood movies, decade after decade, the majority of my students have never heard about Eastern European cinema, neither fictional nor non-fictional. Is there any plan in place to break through this Hollywood cultural iron curtain in the near future? Who would like to have a go at that? <laughs> uh, so this is a very important question uh, because the most important question in, in uh, our field, uh, in, in film or theater, this is distribution. Uh, because uh, without distribution, we can do new movies, we can do anything. We need income. This is an economic question too. You, <laughs> you said this is a forum. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, this is a, the main problem, uh, not only the Visegrad or Central European countries, but uh, whole Europe. Uh, we have to make uh, much more stronger uh, distribution for our movies. Not only our movies, but our television production, our streaming uh, uh, our channels. And uh, I have to say proudly, <laughs> we use this uh, strange time uh, by the Hungarian uh, National Film Institute and create uh, a, a new streaming channel. The channel title is Filmio, Filmio. And uh, we started a negotiation with the Visegrad four countries uh, to make this film not only for the Hungarian viewers, uh, but for the Central European uh, region. And uh, the, the reason why, uh, this is the same. Uh, in the H Hungarian film archive, we collected uh, wonderful movies and uh, now there is the uh, d digitalization, the old movies and, and cleaning and so on. And we started uh, this new Filmio channel uh, with the 160 uh, old Hungarian movies. And this is a huge success now here in Hungary. And we started to negotiate with the Czech archives because uh, we have very good connections in the Polish archives. And we will start with the, with the Slovak archives because for the youngsters, we have to uh, show uh, 
uh, what's happened in the last uh, 120 years, because the Hungarian film uh, uh, art uh, in this year will be uh, 120 years old. After uh, five years, the Lumiere uh, brothers, when discovered the movie, we started to make movies here in Hungary. In, uh, we have wonderful uh, films, a lot of co-productions with you guys. I mean, with Polish, Czechs, and so on. And uh, we, we love these movies because uh, we love the, the characters, uh, we love the subjects. And I think so, this is a very good beginning uh, to talk about uh, our, our movies, to make special distribution for it. The next step, uh, because uh, a lot of uh, people said here in Hungary, okay, uh, we are closing the movies because uh, the streaming channel is not a good thing. But uh, we will start from September to make film clubs. When I was a university student, uh, we have special film clubs. Uh, maybe you don't know uh, in England, what does it mean film club? It's <laughs> when <laughs> there's a community uh, uh, university students or, or others and uh, watching together a movie and we are talking about it. This is very, very important. But this, by this filmio uh, or streaming channel, there will be uh, an opportunity to show from film clubs uh, for a small society to, to movies. And uh, this is also a very important step ahead uh, about the distribution because we have no big cinemas. We have art cinemas, as you, Irana, mentioned, uh, but we have not enough movies. Uh, when I was uh, a youngster, Budapest, we have 100 movies, movie theaters, separate. Now we have big uh, cinema centers in, in the shopping malls. There are American movies. It's very difficult uh, to uh, get a place for the Hungarian movies. But we have to be very pushy and we have to be together very pushy because uh, this is our goal to, to show, uh, because in, by these uh, movies, uh, we have uh, opportunity to show our identity and with our new movies, because to this channel, we will put uh, our new movies or our new mini series, because this is also very important by our, our uh, storytelling. Uh, I, I believe it, uh, it, it will be a huge success. And I'm addressing to you guys, uh, please collaborate in Filmio and go ahead for, <laughs> on the film of this kind of distribution. Yeah. Um, Daniel Pajan is asking, do you subtitle these Hungarian movies? Yes, uh, in, we started uh, uh, to make it because all days, this is only in Hungary, uh, you can uh, reach, but from the next year, it, uh, you, you will reach uh, in, in Europe. And first time it will be in uh, English subtitle. But we would like to make not only in English, but, but other subtitles too. And uh, uh, perhaps a related question, Vera Lustig asks, um, it's for anybody on the panel, she's of uh, Czech extraction, but living in the UK. How good do you think media coverage and discussion of theatre and art house European film is in the Visegrad, uh, Visegrad countries. Um, makes the point that British media tends to focus on US and UK output in terms of, of films. Susanna, do you have a feeling on, uh, I suppose it's, no. it's harder with theatre. Um, um, translates more, but... Um, um, theatre is even uh, more difficult to promote in foreign countries than, than films. We sometimes envy our film colleagues that they have an uh, easy platform to, to share this, uh, while the uh, theatre experience is almost not transferable. But uh, I would like to mention a couple of uh, things before to answer uh, answering your question that uh, 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 European Union is planning to 
uh, set up um, Perform Europe uh, like digital platform for touring. So this would enable us maybe in future to share the cultural and especially theater uh, theater pieces, performances, and much broader uh, arena. Uh, there, there are first steps uh, done by our Czech colleagues called Ramox, and they are sharing also some some Slovak uh, performances, let's say. And I know the, there are similar activities online uh, uh, in many other countries, like Edison Online, and these, uh, um, and not speaking about. The some of the films from Central Europe, uh, uh, they are already available on Netflix and other platforms. So, so if you really are interested, you can find, for instance, the the only Oscar film uh, from Czechoslovakia uh, shop on 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 the main street on Netflix as well with subtitles. But uh, that's a really broader question and and the cultural discussion you mentioned is crucial, definitely. I've been working for, for years in, in the media and it's just, just inevitable part of the whole circus. It's not just about distribution, it's not just about production, but also the, uh, the critical reflection. But I, when I uh, ask some some friends in Britain about um, the, the question why I am not interested in our films, our theaters, they they just replied in a very uh, strict manner. If we we are buying your cars, we would be interested in your culture as well. So uh, I think that that there is a, some some. Some economic reason we are not economically enough important for maybe uh, to 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 be interested in our culture. Just um, to put it very frankly, though I would like to stress, Slovakia is one of the highest production productors of cars. So car you you can buy it's a very high <laughs> high. Um, the, the there is a high chance that it's it was produced by by Slovak <laughs> Slovak so mm. let's let's be interested in Slovak culture as well <laughs> indeed um I've got two questions here which are about the Visegrad group itself maybe Christoph you can um help us with these Martin Gromenitsky who is an advertising professional in Warsaw um, is asking, do you feel it's only of late that the Visegrad group has come of age, uh, whereas neighbours like Slovenia, Romania, Ukraine or Austria are stepping up their interest in the grouping? Up to a few years back, our countries kept looking to Western European partners. Um, in my view, this is now rapidly changing. Isn't it time to intensify parallel contacts um, including the cultural ones, and look for inspiration that may be lacking. And linked to that, possibly also about the uh, what is your view of, of the Visegrad group, um, Jakob Wojtek, um, who is at Andrasi University in Budapest, says some people worry the Visegrad group is repositioning to promoting um, ultra... Sorry, I lost his... Um, this question's gone off my screen. Um, is repositioning to promoting nationalist and ultra right wing ideas. Do you think artists in the region would cooperate with this or resist, or perhaps be accidentally complicit in promoting this political agenda? Is this happening? Is it a risk? He asks. Christoph, do you want to go into the politics? <laughs> Right, it is a risk, and there is uh, the, the, among the artists the amount of conformists is always very big. So they sell the talent for something that sells well for the market. But I don't think it is very relevant because this happened in, in the past, and we know that the propagandistic art has never been very successful with the audience. But what I'm curious is. If our part of the world, this peripheral Europe, could create 
more balanced vision of human happiness? And if so, then we may produce products that will be attractive to the others. I know that in Bhutan, the index of happiness is the highest in the world. Unfortunately, they have no cinema. But if they had, we will all go to see Bhutan films to understand why they consider themselves happy. How do they create, how they construct their life to be, to be so pleased with it. And I think this is the only chance we have to propose a vision of life that will differ from most tendencies which are now prevailing in, in Western Europe and sometimes leave us very disappointed because there is either cynicism or bitterness or complex of guilt, however, we are all guilty of something, but no vision, no perspective, no, no hope, no desire to leave, to create a better world. And we should always try <clears throat> to see some better vision of the world and see what should we change in our life in order to make this life more meaningful. Thank you, Christoph. Um, Irena, um, I think you, you have a view on, on Jakob's question, particularly on, on what uh, Visegrad is in danger or not of, uh, of, of supporting. Ooh, I'm always so bad in following the questions. Can you please <laughs> yeah. remind me what was it? Um, so Jakob was saying, um, I'm, I'm paraphrasing him, but um, Visegrad was established to, um, in, in a positive spirit of, uh, of integration, and it was maybe, maybe easy for artists to support that. But now we are at a point where uh, some nationalist movements or right-wing extremists see the group as an alternative to the EU, a part of Inter Mariam. Um, is there any, um, how do you see it? Um, is there any artistic potential in this new image of the Visegrad Four to be used? Um, but is there a risk that some artists will fall into this trap, uh, this narrative, or are they immune to it? Um, the mute, yes. Um, I'm not sure if I would have exact answer, but what I would say in general, uh, what I see as my role or anyone of us working in arts, uh, it's basically to use our talent and energy exactly for the opposite, not, not to support racism or any divisions uh, between humans, but actually looking at how, what is it that unites us, no? Um, and uh, if some people choose to do differently, uh, well, we can't stop them. All we can do is to become stronger, to be doing some the opposite. Um, and uh, whatever is happening in, in Vishika countries, it's not only happening here, it's all over the world. And I really think that uh, always, but even now, again, more than ever, uh, arts have super important role. And uh, meetings like this and exchanges online and the fact that, as I said, the fact that we for first time ever experienced something, uh, the same thing that many people in different countries, it doesn't matter how rich or poor countries are, uh, many people start st stayed without work, many people had the same fear of getting ill. And I think just this collective experience of the same, it's something that connects us. And all we have to make sure is that we, um, it's not always easy because propaganda in each country, you know, politicians, unfortunately, they speak what's beneficial for them in that moment, not really thinking about what's good for people. And uh, because media, especially with the, with the mass media are so strong that it's not always easy to get information that keeps the critical mass among uh, people. So that's why, again, we have to do our work. We have to have festivals, we have to have uh, cultural institutions in the country, outside the country, we have had to have producers, directors, distributors, and to keep uh, making films and theater and all other sorts of arts to, to keep people uh, out of the box, not thinking differently, looking at uh, life and what is important in life in different way. So that's all I, I can say um, related to this. 
I think um, I think that's a good it's a good thought to to end on, Irena. I mean, let the light in, and I think um, film and and theatre and and other forms of arts indeed are really good for doing that. Sadly, we've run out of time. Um, I'm sorry if I didn't get to everybody's questions, but thank you for for the contributions from the audience, and particularly thank you to everyone on the panel. It is an extraordinary and wonderful lineup of you all from across the region and with very different uh, perspectives. So um, a huge thank you for taking part today. And um, uh, there, I think Irina did share um, some links to platforms where you can view award-winning films for Central and European cinema. That's in the chat box if anybody wants to pick up on that. So it only leaves me to thank everybody and thank you and the audience for joining us and good afternoon, good night, wherever you are. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.